The title of my talk is Sinai, A Continuous Spiritual Heritage. When we think of the Desert Fathers, we recall the great Anthony, Pocomius, Sisois, the fathers of Wadi Natrun. All of these are radiant spiritual luminaries, and monks of every age have stood in their shadow. Sinai remained more isolated, more sparsely settled, but it can be pointed out that Sinai need yield to none for antiquity or for excellence of monastic achievements. The monk Ammonius of Canopus was a pilgrim to Sinai and an eyewitness to an invasion of the Saracens in which 40 monks of Sinai were killed. He was present with Dulus, the abbot of Sinai, when a monk named Psoes came, informing him that Blemis had killed 40 monks at Raithor, the biblical Elim on the coast of the Red Sea, where were 12 wells of water and three score and ten palm trees. He had lived at Raithor for 20 years, but he said, but there are others who have dwelt there for 40 years and for 50 and for 60 and for 70 years who have dwelt in the same place. He told them, a certain Moses, having adopted the discipline of monasticism from his youth, practiced monasticism for 73 years in that mountain from which springs of water issued. And this saint, from the time that he took the habit of Christ, ate no flesh, but he ate dates only. The food of that saint was a few dates and water only, and he never tasted wine and his dress was of compressed palm fiber, and he loved silence more than all men. From the many miracles that God wrought through him, all the inhabitants of Iran had come to believe in the Holy Trinity and received baptism. Faran is a biblical refidim on the approach to Sinai. Less a date of diet sound exotic. We recall here the words of Charles Doughty, who traveled throughout Arabia in 1877 to 78 and witnessed what it was to subsist on such a diet. The Arabians inhabit a land of dearth and hunger, and there is no worse food than the date, which they must eat in their few irrigated valleys. This fruit is overheating and inwardly fretting under a sultry climate, too much of cloying sweet, not ministering enough of brawn and bone, and therefore all the date eaters are of a certain weariest visage. Where the date is eaten alone, as they themselves say, human nature decays, and they drink a lukewarm groundwater, which is seldom wholesome in these parts of the world. I was in Raitho in June a few years ago for the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul. The temperature registered 50 degrees Celsius. A hot and searing breeze blew from across the Red Sea. It was yet another small insight into the heroism of the monks who lived there in centuries gone by. The events described by Ammonius allow us to date his account to the year 373. Thus, when he describes elders who have dwelt there as monks for 60, for 70, and more years, we understand that there was already an established monasticism at Sinai and Raitho in the latter third century, when persecutions were still raging against the Christians, when the great Anthony was as yet living in the ruined fort, for he began to live there in 285 and lived there for 20 years. To the end of this sojourn belongs the first great wave of monastic settlement in the desert. Even then there dwelt ascetics at Sinai and Raitho, who were established in virtue, who had attained to the pinnacles of prayer and spiritual graces. The Southeast Chapel of the Sinai Basilica is dedicated to the 40 martyrs of Sinai and Raitho. A marble plaque mounted on the wall, which has been dated to the late 6th century, bears this inscription. Having emulated the baptism by blood of the four ranks of ten, the righteous fathers, equal in number, lie in this place. Theirs is the joyous and true burning bush. Through them, O God, save us. <clears throat> 
Scholars have had different opinions about the best way to understand and translate tetartos de cados. The simplest explanation is that it refers to the four ranks of ten, four times ten, who were martyred at Raithor with an equal number at Sinai, as recorded in the account by Ammonius. Theirs is the joyous and true burning bush. The burning bush is the emblem of their being in the very presence of God. The most important book written at Sinai is a spiritual guide called The Ladder of Divine Ascent by John the Abbot of Sinai, who lived in the latter 6th and early 7th century. From his book, he is known as John Climacus, John of the Ladder. We learn from the life composed by Daniel of Raithor that he was only 16 when he set out on the long and arduous trek to Sinai. He would have walked for many days south along the Red Sea, across vast expanses of sand and gravel, and then turn east following narrow rock-strewn valleys, the mountains around him soaring higher and higher until he came at last to Sinai, the God-trodden mountain. The construction of the great fortress by the Emperor Justinian gave Sinai monasticism a strong center but it did not supplant the earlier tradition of monks living in solitude or in small communities throughout the area. And it is to this tradition that St. John turned, becoming the disciple of one Abba Martyrius. Three years later, he was tonsured a monk at the peak of Sinai, and on his descent he went to receive a blessing from Anastasius the abbot. Seeing him for the first time, he prophesied that one day John would be the abbot. Abba Martyrius died when John was 35, after which he lived as a solitary in a cave, the location of which is known and revered to this day. He spent 40 years in solitude, during which he devoted himself to saying prayers and writing books. This is an indirect reference to manuscript production at Sinai in the 6th century. When he was 75, the prophecy was fulfilled and he became the abbot. It was then that he received a letter from John, the abbot of Raithaw, imploring him to write a book of instruction that should be like the spiritual tablets Moses received or like the ladder that Jacob beheld extending from earth to heaven. John accepted his request in humble obedience and composed his spiritual guide the Ladder of Divine Ascent. By that time, there was an established literature of monastic formation. St. John was well versed in this literature, and in a way, he expects his reader to know these texts as well. He quotes Mark the Monks on the Spiritual Law, the Adhikos of Fotikis, Gnostic Chapters, John Cassian's Conferences, Evagrius Practicos, and two Evlogias, Ephraim's ascetic sermon, several orations by Gregory the theologian, and a great number of accounts from the Apothegmata Patrum and other collections, such as John Mosco's Spiritual Meadow and Palladius' Lossiac History. The Apothegmata Patrum and Evagrius Practicos especially had sought to arrange the vices and virtues in a progression. These are pedagogical catalogs. St. John refers to the chain of the eight deadly sins compiled by the discerning fathers, categories that derive from the vagrius practicos. There are instances when he accepts the traditional order. He writes, Therefore, in order not to change the order of the learned, we, unlearned as we are, have followed the same convention and rule. But in the discussion of lipi, sorrow, mourning, he makes a radical departure. Evagrius writes that a monk may recall relatives and friends and the life that he had before becoming a monk. If he dwells on these thoughts, he will feel sorrow, or sorrow may follow outbursts of anger. This is debilitating sorrow, and he lists it as the fourth of the eight generic logismi. For St. John, however, sorrow and mourning are the very foundations of the life of repentance. He writes, 
Mourning is a golden spur, and a soul which is stripped of all attachment and of all ties, fixed by holy sorrow to watch over the heart. Sorrow and mourning lead to compunction and tears, and from these joy dawns forth, a joy that is lasting and profound. He writes, Tears over our departure produce fear, but when fear gives birth to fearlessness, joy dawns. But when constant joy is obtained, holy love bursts into flower. To express this paradox, St. John coined a new word, harmolipi, joy-making mourning, sorrow that gives birth to joy. St. John writes from within the tradition of monastic formation, but he does not merely systematize his heritage. Writing with authority, based on his own experience and the examples he has encountered through his many years as a monk and spiritual guide, he transforms the tradition, investing it with new meanings. St. John writes with profound insight about hesychia, quietude, spiritual vigilance, and the recitation of the Jesus prayer. Here we can recognize the Hezekiah's prayer of the heart, developed later in Constantinople and on Mount Athos, but present at Sinai in the 6th century. At the very summit of the ladder, St. John writes, Agapi angelon stasis, agapi prokopi ton eonon. Love is a state of angels, Love is the progress of eternity. Virtue and love have no limit, either in this life or in the age to come. We read, Love has no boundary, and both in the present and in the future age, we shall never cease to progress in it as we add light to light. Perhaps this may seem strange to many. Nevertheless, it has to be said and the evidence we have, Blessed Father, would lead me to say that even the angels make progress, and indeed that they add glory to glory and knowledge to knowledge. St. John's style can be intentionally enigmatic. He customarily begins each step with a theoretical definition on the topic under consideration. This initial suggestion is, is amplified and elaborated but the meaning of the text hangs suspended until the end of the discourse when he writes summary statements. The reader then needs to follow the trail of the text back through the step to fully grasp what has been said. He delights in using assonance, alliteration, and other poetic expressions. There are times when verses from the Psalter are so interwoven into the text that they are barely discernible as quotations. He uses a carefully chosen vocabulary, parallelism, and conscious word order. When compared to late antique models, it can be shown that St. John's style conforms to the common literary convention or literary practice prevalent in his time. At the beginning of the latter, St. John writes, we strive to follow Christ in thought, word, and deed, believing rightly and blamelessly in the Holy Trinity. This could be considered the very definition of a Christian. But while he writes with profound insight on spirituality, what it is to follow Christ in thought, word, and deed, he says surprisingly little about doctrine, what it is to believe rightly and blamelessly in the Holy Trinity. And yet, such occasional references as he makes to doctrinal issues are sufficient to show the link that exists between the two. For this reason, these references, few in number as they are, remain of great significance. St. John explains the relation between obedience and stillness by comparing the doctrine of the Trinity to that of Christ. What is said in the dogma of the holy, uncreated, and adorable Trinity contrasts with the doctrine of the providential incarnation of one of the persons of this all-him Trinity. For what is plural in the Trinity is single in him, and what there is single here is plural. And in the same way, some undertakings are suitable for those in stillness and others for those in obedience. <clears throat> 
In the Holy Trinity, there are three persons, one in nature. Christ has two natures, the divine and the human, united in one person. But the most significant among the Christological passages in the latter is the brief reference to Gethsemane in step six on remembrance of death. Fear of death is a property of nature that comes from disobedience, but trembling at death is a sign of unrepented sins. Christ fears death, but he does not tremble in order to demonstrate the properties of his two natures. Christ fears death in that he took upon himself the fullness of our human nature, yet he does not tremble at death, he who was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. St. John here invokes the definition of Chalcedon, acknowledging two natures which undergo no confusion, no change, no division, no separation. In step 28, on holy and blessed prayer, St. John writes, Some say that prayer is better than the remembrance of death, but I praise two natures in one person. The Chalcedonian definition can just be heard in the background. There are three saints whose spiritual texts form a distinctly Sinite school of ascetic theology. The first is John Climacus, abbot of author of the Ladder of Divine Ascent. The second is Hezekias, the priest, abbot of the monastery of the Burning Bush, who lived around the 8th or 9th centuries. He wrote an ascetic treatise on watchfulness and holiness, in which he stressed the central importance of inner attentiveness, the guarding of the heart, and the unceasing invocation of Jesus Christ. We read, just as a man blind from birth does not see the sun's light, so one who fails to pursue watchfulness does not see the rich radiance of divine grace. And the third is Philotheos of Sinai, who was abbot of the monastery of the burning bush. He lived in perhaps the ninth or 10th century and is known to us from his work, 40 texts on watchfulness. He writes, at every hour and moment, let us guard our heart with all diligence from thoughts that darken the soul's mirror. For on that mirror, Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God the Father, forms himself and luminously inscribes himself. Let us consider this logion in some detail. In his first epistle to the Corinthians, St. Paul declared that the gospel he had preached to them was the same that he had himself received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he arose again the third day according to the scriptures. In the third chapter of his second epistle, Paul draws a contrast. Those who reject this gospel are like those who have the covenant of God engraven in stones. They are like those who were blinded by the glory that shone forth from the countenance of Moses when he descended from Mount Sinai, so that he had to put a veil over his face to conceal the glory. On the other hand, those who receive this gospel have the covenant of God written with the spirit of the living God upon the fleshly tables of their hearts. With Moses, they experience a direct apprehension of spiritual things. St. John Chrysostom, in his commentary on Corinthians, has expressed this well. For when Moses talked with the Jews, he kept his face covered, but when he turned to God, it was uncovered. Now this was a type of that which was to come to pass, that when we have turned to the Lord, then we shall see the glory of the law, and the face of the lawgiver bare. Yea, rather, not this alone, but we shall then be even in the same rank with Moses. Continuing his thought about the glory that shone from Moses' countenance, St. Paul writes, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Mirrors in the classical world were traditionally made of bronze or silver. The metal had to be carefully polished to create a reflective surface 
and it had to be kept polished so that the reflective surface would not be dulled by oxidation. Mirrors tended to be small. It was difficult to polish larger pieces of metal while keeping the surface perfectly flat. In our modern understanding of physics, a mirror image is an illusion caused by rays of light being reflected on the surface of the mirror. But if we think of it in this way, we will miss much of the significance of St. Paul's use of this metaphor. We must ask, how were mirror images understood in the classical world? Plato in the Timaeus explains how it is that we see and the properties of mirror images. Daylight is a subtle fire pervading the atmosphere. Wherever the eye is directed, the stream of fire from the eye and the fire in the atmosphere, which is of one and the same substance, combine and form a ray of homogeneous fire all along the line of vision. This, on meeting the rays from the object, which is the cause of its visibility, receives their vibrations and transmits them to the eye. In a reflected image, the rays from the object are arrested by the smooth, shining surface of the mirror. The combined current of vision, opsios revma, and the daylight, methimerinon force, are arrested on the same surface and thus come into conjunction with the rays from the object. The mirror is the cause of contact between the fire of the subject and the fire of the object. These two fires coalesce upon the surface of the mirror and the motions, kinesis, of this combination are transmitted along the visual stream and impressed upon the retina. When St. Paul wrote, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, those who heard him would have known that the polished surface of the mirror was the place where the light from the eye meets the light from the thing seen, and these two sets of rays of light coalesce there to form the mirror image. This provides us with an insight into the continuation of this verse, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We are transformed by this meeting, this encounter, that takes place upon the polished surface of the mirror. In St. John Chrysostom's understanding of this verse, this is not something that we behold only, but we are ourselves the polished mirror, receiving and reflecting this transforming radiance of the glory of the Lord. He writes, Just as if pure silver be turned towards the sun's rays, it will itself also shoot forth rays, not from its own natural property merely, but also from the solar luster. So also doth the soul, being cleansed and made brighter than silver, receive a ray from the glory of the Spirit and send it back. Wherefore also he saith, reflecting as a mirror, we are transformed into the same image from glory, that of the Spirit, to glory, our own, that which is generated in us, and that of such sort as one might expect from the Lord, the Spirit. St. Athanasius of Alexandria was still a young man when he wrote two important theological treatises. They were meant to be read together. The first is Contra Gentes, Against the Gentiles. The knowledge of religion and the truth of things can be discovered from the words of Holy Scripture. For the sacred and divinely inspired scriptures are sufficient for the exposition of the truth. Yet there are also many treatises of blessed teachers, which, if one happens upon them, he will gain some notion of the interpretation of the scripture and will be able to attain to the knowledge he desires. The power of Christ and of the cross has filled the whole world overcoming whatever has separated human beings from God, recreating them and restoring them to communion with God. The second treatise is the Incarnatione, on the Incarnation. In it, Athanasius writes that he has provided an elementary instruction and an outline of the faith in Christ and his divine manifestation to us. 
By incarnation, Athanasius does not limit himself to the nativity of Christ, but he proceeds to expound what he has accomplished in the body, conquering death and bestowing knowledge of the Father in the light of the Passion. And this cannot be separated from the body of Christ, that is, those who by faith in the cross are no longer subject to the corruption of death. St. Athanasius writes that human beings were created for communion with God through a contemplation of his word and image, the Savior Jesus Christ. Origen had tried to do the same, but he failed to reconcile his metaphysics with incarnational theology. Using the analogy of a mirror allowed St. Athanasius to express this in a way that is in keeping with Nicene Orthodoxy. He writes, so when the soul has put off every stain of sin with which it is tinged and keeps pure only what is in the image, then when this shines forth, it can truly contemplate as in a mirror the word, the image of the Father, and in him meditate on the Father of whom the Savior is the image. We were created in the image of God, the ideal of the soul, as a mirror reflecting God is thus a metaphor that sees the soul as a real, though dependent, image of God. It suggests that there is a real similarity between the soul and God without suggesting that there is an ontological continuity between the image in the mirror and that of which it is the image. The two differ in nature. As the soul is purified, it more accurately reflects the image of God, it becomes more truly that image. The soul that becomes luminous reflects the icon of the Savior by his grace and condescension and mercies and loving kindness. But the Logos, the Word of God, is himself the icon of the Father by nature, homoousion to patri, consubstantial with the Father, as we confess in the Nicene Creed. We turn again with renewed insight to the words of St. Philotheos of Sinai. At every hour and moment, let us guard our heart with all diligence from thoughts that darken the soul's mirror. For on that mirror, Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God the Father, forms himself and luminously inscribes himself. Jesus Christ forms himself, he imprints himself, dipusta, upon the polished mirror of the soul. He luminously inscribes himself. To express this, the saint had to create a new word, photinographista. He inscribes himself with radiance upon the polished mirror of the soul. Some distance below the peak of Sinai lies the basin of the prophet Elias. If you continue on around from there, after about an hour's walk, you come to several remote chapels. The most remote of them all is the chapel of St. Anne, perched incongruously next to massive outcrops of solid granite. It is my favorite of all the little chapels in the Sinai Mountains. I first saw the chapel of St. Anne in January of 2005, when I joined Father Nilas as he took holy water from the Theophany services to bless all of the outlying chapels. The roof had cracked, allowing water to seep in. This was eroding the earth mortar between the stones, and much of the plaster inside had fallen off. No one had celebrated the divine liturgy in the chapel for many years because it had become so dilapidated. But every detail of the chapel seemed to have been made with sensitivity and devotion, and it was beautiful even in that state. I was able to clean the chapel, and an iconographer I know sent me a photograph of an icon of St. Anne that he had painted that I was able to print and frame. We returned on July the 25th, the feast day of St. Anne, to celebrate the Divine Liturgy. It was a great joy, and we have been back every year since then. That was the last time Father Michael celebrated the liturgy as a deacon, for he was ordained a priest on August the 6th, 
the Feast of the Holy Transfiguration. The Chapel of St. Anne is oriented so that on the Feast of St. Anne, the first rays of the rising sun enter the tiny east window. As the sun rises into the sky, the chapel and the entire area become suffused with light. The first sunbeams that enter are butterscotch, and the whitewashed walls reflect the golden color. The rays of light shine to the right side of the chapel. As the sun climbs into the sky, the light becomes white, and the sunbeams come to rest directly in front of the holy table. In 2006, we started the service later than usual. Towards the end of the liturgy, the sunbeams were shining directly on the holy table. Every detail of the chapel is beautiful. In 2008, Father Ioannikios was visiting for us from the monastery of Masava outside Jerusalem. He wanted to join us for the Feast of St. Anne, but at the same time, he needed to return to Jerusalem with pilgrims who were leaving that morning. So we decided to have the liturgy at night. We, reached, we left the monastery a little before 9.30 in the evening when they locked the gates for the night. We reached the chapel of St. Anne shortly after midnight and immediately began the service. During Orthros, we chanted all of the odes for all of the canons as is the practice at Marsavas. We finished the celebration of the divine liturgy a little before five in the morning, and soon after it began to get light for our descent to the monastery. The night was spent in prayer and services and spiritual joy, and Father Ioannikios was in time to return to Jerusalem with the other pilgrims. That same year, the chapel of St. Anne was renovated. Mortar on the roof and outside walls that had crumbled was replaced. The plaster inside was patched and the walls and ceiling whitewashed. A wooden floor was installed over the earlier dirt floor while retaining the flagstones at the eastern end of the chapel. I have been able to return to the chapel of St. Anne for the three-day fast at the beginning of Great Lent. The silence is profound and overwhelming. It is in such places and at such moments that we feel we have stepped back in time a thousand years to encounter the ancient Sinai. We read in the 28th step of the Ladder of Divine Ascent, Prayer, by reason of its nature, is the converse and union of man with God, and by reason of its action, upholds the world and brings about reconciliation with God. These are noble and inspiring words, and they have reached us in a living spiritual heritage. But they were born in the silence and austerity of the desert. How can we continue this heritage when the silence and austerity of those times has come to an end? This is the challenge that we face at Sinai today. But we live in a place sanctified by the revelations of God to the prophets Moses and Elias, and by so many generations of monks who have come to this place and reached great spiritual heights. We read in the life of St. John Climacus, he took up the monastic yoke in Mount Sinai, and I think by the visible nature of the place itself, he was impelled and guided towards the invisible God. We live in the same place. It is our challenge to carry this heritage forward, preserving it at Sinai and sharing it with the world.